I guess what I'm going to do then tonight, uh, in intermediate discipleship, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to teach you apologetics. So, so that's what's going to happen in intermediate discipleship. And then for advanced discipleship is uh, where we cover about how to teach and then how to preach. And then I'm going to do that a little bit more advanced. Intermediate, I'm also going to teach you how to teach and preach. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to lay down all the necessary foundations in discipleship. That way all of you people can get a bigger picture of what I'm trying to do. So people online, you're just waiting for the next discipleship to come out. And we're going through theological studies right now. But you're all probably wondering what I had in mind in the discipleship, what I'm trying to do. So what I'm going to do is give you all the layout. And what that will do is this. That will give you a heads up and also uh, an advancement where you can grow faster. And you won't have to wait for my next lesson on it, so to speak. So then uh, this will be like a jumping head start. Now, don't use this as an excuse not to watch our discipleship videos, obviously. Because in the discipleship videos, you're obviously going to get more content, more specifics on what to do. That way you can properly grow in each. This will also be helpful for people online who are just going through so much stuff on the internet. And because of that, that's why you don't have a proper right foundation. And because you don't have a proper right foundation, that's why it's so hard when you uh, study deep doctrine that you're not able to uh, teach it right or study it right or analyze it right. And not only that, your own Christian walk is out of balance as well. So you're not able to communicate successfully with other people. Now, you got to understand this. As a pastor, I pastored a church here for several years. I've been a pastor for almost 10 years. And then in Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area was a couple of years. And throughout this time, the reason why the Lord blessed us with the people that we have and everything else is because I took certain measures, and I hope that people will follow this measure. Now, I'm not saying that I'm the greatest pastor. I believe that everyone's imperfect, including myself, and I'm sure there are some shortcomings that you can find with me. However, I do know this. I know that the Lord blessed me compared to some other pastors when they didn't follow this method. And you're going to see this real quickly. You're going to see this real quickly when you go throughout different churches. Especially some Bible-believing churches or fundamentalist churches that you people are attending it may have been different or even watered down. Now, this is not, uh, perhaps it's because of your misunderstanding of the pastor and the way he runs his ministry. But it also could be the reason because the pastor fails in something. So again, I'm not saying that I'm the best, but I do know this, is that a lot of Christians don't have this proper foundation. And because of this, that's why um, the ministry becomes a struggle. They water down, and the Lord doesn't bless it as much. But he did bless with my church with a lot of things, and I, I'm going to share some of that with you. Okay, here's the first step to understand. The first step to understand is that I kind of covered this in our beginner's discipleship, and this is a crucial aspect people must understand. So I mentioned that the number one thing is to understand that everyone is imperfect, and everyone is different. Everyone is different and imperfect. Now, because a lot of you people who have studied discipleship under my discipleship really well, you guys have been given positions in your churches to actually teach and preach, and the pastor is able to trust you. See, you are able to grow. So that is an important aspect to understand. So I mentioned at the beginning that there are pastors that are watered down, and because of that, that's why I kind of... I'm not pleased with how they do things. But here's the thing, is that you can't have that in your mind because when you have that in your mind when you're serving the pastor, then what's going to happen is that the pastor cannot trust you. That's important to understand. If you can't think that everyone is different and imperfect, you're going to lose trust. 
So you must understand this, that when I say lose trust, I'm not only talking about pastors. I'm talking about people in your church. I'm even talking about your friends and your family members and lost people. That is important to understand. That is extremely important to understand. Now, you got to understand this, is that I came from a liberal school, liberal background. Yet I was able to get the achievements that I can. I'm able to uh, stay in this place without getting arrested yet. And not only that, I'm able to get people online and people in this church. How can I get trust from all these sorts of people? See, that's why it's important to understand that you cannot be self-righteous, ego-centered. That is important to understand. It is so easy when you study more of the Bible and your knowledge grows that what happens is, is that you expect everyone to be at your level. And then you look down on them when they're not to your level. Now, when you do that, what's going to happen is this. Even the most zealous Christian, he'll go along with you at the beginning, but eventually if Satan attacks that person and then he gets discouraged and backslides a little bit, He's going to even be discouraged by you. He's going to even felt put down by you. And he's not going to come back to church. He's not going to help you out. You're going to drive him away. But not only that, it's going to pick fights because people cannot trust you. So it's important to understand that everyone is imperfect. What you have to do is think in their shoes. Think on the shoes of these following people. Your close family members and friend. How would they think? That's why when you try to minister to them, you're going to use more wiser words. You're going to use more wiser tactics to give them the gospel of Christ or to get them to come to your church. You have to think in their shoes. Think about the people in church. Now you got to realize this is that sometimes people, there are some people in church who are better than you on some areas. You're not better than them as you think you are. Everyone has their weaknesses and their strong points and everyone's going to differ from each other. You'd be surprised that there are some members in this church who can have stronger points than even me. So you gotta understand that. So when you think like that, you don't get all judgmental on these people. And when you fellowship with these people, and when you serve God together with these people, then you can get along together, and they can get along with you, and they feel encouraged by you rather than discouraged, rather than feeling judged and put down. Amen. And then they lose their trust on you. Now, here's a great example I'm going to bring up is that Brother Tom, you see him Sunday all the time giving announcements. But y'all didn't realize this. <clears throat> when he got saved, he didn't just go to my church. It took him probably six months or three months to work up the courage to finally give me a call. And then after that, what did I do? I didn't pressure him to come to our church. I simply helped him answer some questions and offered something about our church or anything like that if he was interested. See, I wasn't pressuring him. Then when the next time he talked to me and I communicated with him, you understand this, he didn't go to my church, he went to his Catholic church. <laughs> now, don't you think that it's very easy for me to look down on him and bash him? But you know what I did? I was trying to think in his shoe. He knew what was wrong with the Catholic church. But that's where he was grown up in. That's where he was used to. And not only that, he had a burden to somehow hopefully win some of his friends and people to Jesus Christ. And I was thinking in my head, there ain't, there ain't no way they're going to listen to you. <laughs> but did I say that to him? No. Instead, I gave him some suggestions. I also uh, told him that I'd be praying about it. And then maybe the Lord might work it out. I said, who knows? Maybe some of them might move and stuff like that. This has been going on a few more months or maybe a year probably. Yeah, so it was a long time. See, I didn't get the kind of preacher 
and teacher and one of my right hand men until I had to what? I had to earn, not lose. I had to earn his trust. And you earn their trust when you think in their shoes, their shoes, not yours. When you're thinking yours, you're ego-centered. Yes, sir. Darker marker. Mm -hmm. Okay then. So I will. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this black guy then. So I'll use somebody else. Okay. So it is important to understand that we got to think in their shoes, not your shoes. This is the problem. You know what the sign of this is? I don't care how much Bible you know in your head. You know what this is? This is a sign of being a baby Christian. This is being a baby carnal Christian. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I can't tell you how many PBI students and Bible-believing preachers and teachers, yeah, I'm talking about you, that has this kind of problem. And because they're in, they're thinking about themselves, 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 that's why they can't reach people. They can't reach people. They turn people off. They think that Bible believers who are dispensational King James only, and especially if you graduated from Ruckman School, that you have no love, you have no grace. That's a bad testimony. That's a horrible testimony. Right. Look at verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as, as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Why? Why are they babes? Look at this, the sign of egocentricity. Verse 3, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? See that? That's the sign of egocentricity. So here's the thing is that there are some people... Uh, that I can name you from the top of my head who are preachers and YouTube uh, online teachers, it's easy for me to pull them up and to point out problems. But if I did that, you know what? That's a sign of carnality. That's a sign of carnality. I got to realize that everyone is imperfect. The only people, now this is something important to understand, which I'll bring to my next point. The only people that I cannot... Uh, compromise and that I will tolerate is people who teach major heresy and major sins. And when they have that kind of powerful influence, then I don't hesitate to expose. And even if people, if I get hundreds of people unsubscribing me, people leaving my church, people talking bad about me on the internet or through their fellow, in their own fellowships in the revival meetings behind my back, I don't care. Because I love Jesus Christ more than people. Amen. But see, I know my limitations as well in not being egocentric. If it's not a major sin, not a major heresy, then back off. Because they're doing a work like you in trying to convert people to dispensational truth, trying to get people saved, trying to get people to turn to the King James Bible, making people under, convert into independent, fundamental Baptist and getting them to come to those kind of churches. And not just an independent fundamental Baptist church, but a Bible-believing church, one that is more grown in doctrine. That is important to understand. So you got to earn their trust. That is very important. So you got to think in their shoes. Think about people in the church. Think about the pastors, which I talked about earlier. So think about those pastors. Here's the easiest thing to say. If you think that the pastor could do better or it's like, oh, you're wrong here and there and there, you should become the pastor and see what it's like. You think you can do better? Yeah, that's good. Amen. Amen. Here's a really good example. I thought that um, in this one Bible-believing church, the pastor and the people did it wrong. So I was like actually even saying to them that we should do this and we should do that. And so the pastor... And the Bible teachers, they actually relented. And I was just a member in the church that time. You know what happened? 
it caused more tensions in the church rather than more closeness. I thought that by my suggestions it would bring more closeness. It brought more tension. It brought more distance. And my idea, I'm still convinced today, my idea is better. But you see why it didn't work out at the end? Because the Lord wanted me to see that this was not my ministry. This was their ministry. Not only that, the people in there, the environment in there, I'm not well versed and experienced compared to the pastor and the Bible teachers who's been there, who've been there longer than me. You got to realize everybody's different in church. People, my people in this church are not the same as the people at Dr. Upman's church, nor as the people at my uh, father's church, at Pastor Shrive Church. Everybody is different, you got to understand. So the way they do things in church, the environment, if we were to make a Gene Ha Kim, Pastor Gene Ha Kim style of church, you got to understand this, then the churches would shut down and close. Because Silicon Valley, uh, San Francisco Bay Area is far different from up in New York City, far different from Pensacola, Florida, far different from Los Angeles. And not only that, especially if you're in a foreign field as a missionary. That's important to understand. So you got to think in their shoes, the pastor, the people in the church, the family and the friends in the, around you. And here's the main key at the end. It's the environment, the environment you're in. So you got to understand your environment first. And then from there, you can establish. Why do you think that people still come to my church? I'm able to catch you people online because I know what kind of topics would catch your interest. I know what kind of topics would make you believe me. I know what kind of things that I can say, the delivery and the style that I do would make you trust me and keep you coming to church next Sunday, keep you watching us online. Why do you think the Lord blessed me with over 100,000 subscribers now? It's not because I'm the best, I'm the great. It's because I had to humble myself outside of this egocentricity and think about what would they think in their shoes. That is important. Why do you think I survived in Silicon Valley, San Fran Bay Area? You think that when I go street preaching, when an officer comes to me, that I go up to them and tell them, well, I have my rights because this rule says this, this rule says that? No, I don't even do it that way. I have the legal right to say it. It is right, legally right for me to say that to him, but I don't do that. Why? Because I'm trying to think in their shoes. I'm thinking, what is the officer thinking? The officer thinks I'm just like one of those many weird street preachers trying to cause a problem. And cops, uh, they don't like to mess with trivial issues. They just want to see if you're innocent. So what do I do? I give the smile. I let them know, oh, we're only here for only an hour, that's it, you know? I mean, that's it, and we're almost done, by the way, so we're going to leave real soon. We only come here like once in a blue moon, and uh, we only talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's all we want. I only said that one time to one cop after seven years of street preaching here. Isn't that very telling? And then you see in our videos how we do street preaching and the souls we led to Jesus Christ, the thousands of tracts we passed out and the hundreds of souls that got saved. Why do you think God blessed us that much? See, you got to think in their shoes. It's so easy to go by, well, this is just my character. This is just how I am. Look, you got to humble yourself if you're going to minister to others. A ministry is not about you. A ministry is about others. It's ministry. What do you think minister means? Serving, yeah. waiting on yeah. people. Amen. That's what minister means. If you want God to use you, you got to have that mindset and put aside your character, put aside your attitude. Maybe a person is more mature, more serious than you, and you got to give that kind of environment. Maybe the person is more light, more happy, more cheery. Go along with that. Maybe the young person in the church can't get along because it's too old. Meet up to their level. Maybe an elderly person doesn't feel like he or she is part of the church because it's not suiting to her level. Suit, uh, suit it to the elderly person as well. Now look, we are an extremely international church, aren't we? Isn't that a blessing from God? Amen. But you know how the Lord can bless me with that? I have to be extremely flexible to everybody.
of their nationality, background, age, sex, etc. Hey, when we started, for example, we start, some of you onliners who watched us for a long time, some of you know Big Chuck. Big Chuck, he's like a, you know, you'll hear his voice at the background, amen, 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 or talking at the background. But he was an elderly man and he's suffering cancer. Now, there are some people who complain about uh, you should quiet him down, but how can I say that to an elderly man who the Lord saved his soul from hell, out of hell's angels, and not only that, I had a bunch of, you know who else I had in the church? You talk about totally black and white, total opposites end of the pole. I had a bunch of Korean people in the church. You know how Korean people are? They're very quiet and serious. Now, how am I going to handle, now, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to handle this? You know what I had to do? I had to do a lot of praying. And I had to do a lot of conversing why I can somehow meet it to the Korean people and Big Chuck. Amen. But you know what happened as well? The Lord used that where the members themselves can mature and start to meet each other's cultures and characters as well. That's a sign of maturity. See how you grow faster as a disciple and even as a minister is that it's truly about others, not you. That's important to understand. Okay, number two. Now, this is where we come down to water down pastors, okay? This is where we come down to water down pastors. So, what we believe in is doctrine. That is extremely important. I stand for right doctrine, and I cannot stand it. I cannot stand to water it down, Amen. no matter what. No matter what. Now, Remember, everyone is imperfect and everyone is different. If you want God to bless you, you got to stand for right doctrine, not just get, get along with everybody. Now, this is important to understand. This is why I don't recommend some people. See, I'm very careful with who I recommend online. Again, number one, everyone is different and imperfect. So, as long as they're serving the cause of Jesus Christ, what do I do? I don't condemn them. I wish them triple blessing even above mine. I don't get jealous at all. I get actually very happy. But here's the thing is that, see, there's this balance as well that just because that I'm happy that they're doing the Lord's work and they're doing something right, it doesn't also show where I support them 100% either. See, when it comes to imperfections, do I support it? No, I don't support imperfections. Do I condemn it? No, I don't condemn it either. That's the thing with people. They don't understand that. They feel like they have to 100% support or 100% condemn. No, that's not how it works, friend. That's not how it works. You let God handle it. You just mind your own business. It's that simple. You just support where it's right to support, and you condemn where it's right to condemn. And you don't support where it's right not to support. And you don't condemn where it's right not to condemn. See, people don't think like that. There are, because you got to understand this, everyone is what? Different and imperfect, correct? Absolutely. Unless they're like Jesus Christ, then you can find out which one to support 100% and agree in everything. But no one is like that. So what you've got to do is, hey, whatever is preached, whatever is taught, whatever how they're doing in the church, if it's right, I'm going to support it. I'm going to recommend them. I'm going to tell people about it. But if it's something that I know in my heart that the Holy Spirit's leading in my heart, it's not the right thing to do, I'm not going to agree with that, nor am I going to publicly recommend it. But I'm not going to condemn it either because the person is doing a great work for God. And I want that brother in Christ or that sister in Christ, I don't want to cause a tension or a split in the body of Christ between us. That is important to understand. It's like where, okay, so the foot is not the hand, right? As 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says. Mm -hmm. But the hand is not going to cause a controversy that cut off the foot from the body. No, it's still going to be the same body. However, this does not mean that the hand is going to connect with the foot all the time. See, there's still, there's still a distance. There's still a difference. That's important to understand. People don't understand that. 
So what's important to understand is that concerning doctrine, that's why you're not going to see me support 100% or recommending people. I, only, I am very choosy who I have to teach and preach in church. Do you know why? Or oh, why are you like that? You're nitpicky. You didn't like me when I said this one. And you don't like me right here. You might as well not like me, period. What else can I say that will please you? I already went on one end where I'm not being nitpicky. And then now right here, you're calling me nitpicky. It's like, what in the world? What can I say then that will please you? See, you know what the problem is? Problem is flesh, carnality. That's your problem. <clears throat> All right, now concerning doctrine, I taught this before in discipleship. So I don't water down in doctrine. However, everyone's going to be different. Everyone's imperfect, right? So this is where I go. The important thing to understand is that it goes by how was doctrine preached at the beginning? It was through pastors, right? Teachers, correct? It was through preachers and teachers of the word. That's how doctrine is taught. I mean, who wrote your Bible? The Lord used preachers and teachers to write the word of God. Who is the one that uh, guided the church when the church began? Preachers and teachers. If God did not think preachers and teachers were important, he could have let you all go do your own thing, not send you preachers and teachers. What did the Bible say? He laid the foundation. You know what? 1 Corinthians 12. That way you, you people don't doubt me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. This is how God laid the foundation of the church. The problem with people is they don't think like that. It is true our foundation is on Jesus Christ, but if it's just on Jesus Christ without anything built on top of that, you don't have a house. That's a house has a foundation, but it's got to have the walls, it's got to have the roof and everything on top. Verse 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church first, notice, notice, see, apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healing, helps, government, diversities of tongue. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracle? So notice right here that he set in this foundation people. You notice that? He sent, he sent leaders of the church. There were prophets, there were apostles, there were teachers, etc. But the point is, is that there were leaders. People do not want to follow a leader, and that's a problem. Remember, our ultimate leader and authority is Jesus Christ. Amen. But just because you have Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you go rogue. You always have a leader with you. That is important to understand. No, I don't believe that. What did Paul say? Be followers of me as I follow Christ. King David, you know how he became a powerful kingdom? The Bible said he had mighty men who followed him. You have to have a person to follow, a leader. That is important to understand. So how you can find right doctrine, which is important to understand, yes, the foundation has to be the Word of God. If that Word of God conflicts the preacher and the teacher, if it conflicts, then you cross these guys out and you follow the Word of God. But does that mean, you, come on, use your head, are you the most spiritual person in the world that there is not a single preacher and teacher out there for you to follow? And that preacher and teacher has been saved longer than you, witnessed longer than you, prayed longer than you, read the Bible probably more than you. You're going to soon find that out if you go rogue. You know what you're going to soon find out? You're the only one that's right, everyone that's wrong. And then the problem you're going to find out is you, not with them. That's important to understand. Oh, my authority is the word of God. My authority is the word of God. No, I doubt that. It's you. Your final authority is you. It's not the word of God. So that's why it's important to understand that if you do make the word your foundation, you know what's going to happen? Obviously, you're going to have somebody following that. That's how it works. Then what you do after that is you follow them. You follow them why? You follow them when they follow the word. That's important. 
you follow them when they follow the word. And when you follow the word, what happens? You find right doctrine. Oh, I don't believe that. No, you're a liar. You know why? How did you hear about dispensationalism if there was no teacher out there? How did you hear about the King James Bible issue if someone didn't introduce you to that? Someone taught you about that. You think that you discovered it yourself? Why are you watching us online? Why did you watch something online, YouTube? See? Everyone, whether you like it or not, you got something. You found right doctrine from who? From somebody who taught you, from somebody who preached to you. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's why it's important to understand this. That's why you got to understand this. The Lord did not just use the Bible by itself to bring people. You know what he used? He used people who used the word to bring in people. That's how we got the Great Awakening revivals. Why? There were people willing to submit to the word of God and preach in a mighty voice. That's why you got revival. How did we break off from the Roman Catholic Church system? Because there was a person named Luther who submitted himself to the Bible and he said, the, a simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. That's what Amen. he said. Why do you think that we were able to switch to the King James Bible issue? Because there was a man named Peter Ruckman who submitted to the Word of God and then he kicked all the scholars out there. Now the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, they've been saved because of Ruckman who was an Independent Fundamental Baptist pastor himself. See, you got to understand this. The reason why the Lord was able to mightily move throughout the beginning of church history to now is because of people who submitted to the Word of God. It's not just the Bible by itself and you leave it in a stone cold room. You know what happens to that then? It becomes like every other book. It, it collects dust and becomes nothing unless someone picks it up and read it and apply it and use it. Why did the Bible says faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God? Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. You know what the, God gave you the Bible for? So that it can be acted out, not just by itself. It needs to be acted out. That's why you got to understand that. That's why you got to understand this is how you find the right movement. Is based on what? This combination. I'm not saying one or the other. I'm saying this combination together. This combination together is how we find right doctrine together. So that's why it's important to understand that you go by right doctrine. That's why, I fought, that's why you got to pick the right people. It's important to do that. That's why, what, what did I do? In discipleship, I gave you our resources link, right? www.bbcenglish.org If you go to that website, there's a source called resources. And if you click on resources, what do you think it's going to give you? All the resources you need. Why, why am I able to teach to you and live like this as a church? Find the right things. You know why I'm able to do that? It took years. And going under the right kind of preachers and teachers. So what I did was com compiled all that together, combined all that together, and put out this website for you. You'll find a church directory list over there. And you're going to find uh, different preachers and teachers online over there. You're going to see uh, different websites that can help you find the right kind of resources. Again, we're all imperfect and different. But here's the point right here. The point is, I've, I've given you at least a movement, a group of people to follow. And that is very important to understand is that you got to go by this. When you go by this, then what happens is you don't compromise. And when you don't compromise, then you're more careful with the people you hang around with. See that? People don't understand how to fellowship. That's one thing I learned. People don't understand how to fellowship. And that's why you're going to have some Bible-believing preachers and teachers. God bless their heart. The Lord has mightily used them. But they're in fellowship with independent fundamental Baptist pastors who do not believe strongly in doctrine like we do. 
And the Bible-believing pastor knows it. They don't believe in strong doctrine like I do. But you know what? I'll still fellowship with that person. I'll still have him come to my meeting and speak in my church. You want to take a chance where that pastor, that speaker you invited, wrongly influences your member? Do you know how many Bible believers that I know who attend a Bible-believing church? And instead of going to a Bible-believing school or institute where they can study, they go to an IFB school instead. You know why? Because their pastor recommended it. And he's supposed to be a Bible-believing pastor too. And he knows those IFB schools, they're watered down in doctrine. How about that? I know a Bible-believing teachers who fellowship with people who don't believe hell is eternal. I know of Bible-believing uh, preachers and teachers who fellowship with people who get into hyper-dispensationalism or into weird end-time prophecy stuff that we don't teach, we don't preach. A lot of people don't online, online don't like it when I say we, 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 and we. But you got to understand this. You know why I say we? Because it's important you have a group of people, Amen. preachers and teachers who follow the word of God, not rogue. Yeah. I don't say I, 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 I. Right. Yeah. I say we because I have my crowd. It's important to do that. You've got to have a following, a group of people where you can know, the Bible says, in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. And you know what kind of counselors you want? You want the best kind of counselors. You don't want a counselor that's going to slip up here and there. You want the best guy. So that's why we provided this for you. That's why I stress so much about the fact about we, we, we. And then I recommended you these... Uh, other Bible-believing preachers and teachers. And there are other Bible-believing preachers and teachers that I did not recommend because I know what happened. I know the problems. Well, why don't you condemn the person? Ah, uh, see? You forgot point number one. Point number one. See, you, people, you know what they have a problem? These two points. That's why God can't establish you as a disciple or mightily use you. You want God the Holy Spirit mightily use you? He wants to see where you're so right on doctrine and in practice, but at the same time, you don't cause an arrogant spirit where you're condemning everybody. Amen. See that? That's important to understand. Now here's another thing is that where you're right here, you got to realize this. If I'm not going to compromise, I also got to realize this. I also have to condemn. Wait a minute, I thought you said not to condemn. Condemn major heresy, major sin. You got to condemn that. That's why, oh, the preacher's a little different from you, so, you know, why would you condemn? No, I'm going to do it because it's a major heresy and sin. I'm going to expose it. I don't care. And that's how God blessed me. It's amazing. If you don't believe me, why do you think one of our most viral videos had to be this one when I was condemning some preacher for, for major heresy and sin? I should have been losing people, but I actually gained more people. I was like, whoa, what a funk. <laughs> you know why? That's God blessing because I don't compromise. Now, how we can find major heresy and sin. So if there's a sin that if, and a heresy that affects the testimony of the church, and when it affects the testimony, it has to be kicked against. That's why there are some IFB schools and pastors that I do call out, that I do call out. Some Bible-believing preachers, they fellowship uh, with Lancaster Baptist Church, with Pastor Paul Chapel. Me? I don't. I kick him. Uh, if I lose uh, Bible-believing friends because of saying that, I'm sorry. But that's my conviction, and that's why the Lord blessed me. I'm not going to condemn you for fellowshipping with Chapel or call you out by name, but I'm going to condemn Paul Chapel. I am going to condemn him. Because he's my attention. He's the one. Why? Because he has a major influence throughout people. And because he has such a major influence throughout people, that's why I'm going to kick him. I am going to expose him. Come on, that's what I do. Now, I only did one video against him. I didn't do like 
dozens of videos like I did against some preachers. You know why? Because there are some preachers who teach a lot of heresy. And then there are other preachers who just have a watered down, lighter version. They're just teaching some sort of wrong doctrine. So that's why I condemn. Concerning what? Well, it comes down to, you know, two main issues that you noticed, right? So two main issues when it comes to doctrine right here, these are salient areas. The first is the King James Bible issue. Why? If you don't have a perfect book in your hand, you can't find right doctrine when some word is changed. Words change, change a whole doctrine. Dispensationalism. If they don't teach a doctrine that's accordingly to dispensationalism, then yeah, then I would expose the person. I would correct the person. I would say it's wrong, it's heresy. Well, it doesn't matter about pre-trib rapture, post-trib rapture, dispensational salvation, etc. No, I call it out. I call it out. Oh, it's not that important. It's not that important. How many people online have I gotten whose eyes have been opened and found right doctrine the most because this was the number one issue. This was the number one doctrine out of everything that solved all the wrong doctrines for them. And that's, it's not that important after all, I guess, dispensationalism. That's why I condemn hyper-dispensationalism too. Amen. See, because right division makes a key difference with everything. And then what I do is this, is that I also get on them if they're not growing in doctrine. See, if they stay stuck on baby milk, and they get the fundamentals right, but they don't grow more in doctrine, then you know what I do? What I do is that sometimes I'll expose that too. I'll say, hey, you got to feed them. You got to get them to grow. It depends upon the person, the circumstance, the situation. So I have to be considerate of that before I call them out on this one. But yeah, sometimes I'll call them out if they don't do that. There are some doctrines that some pastors do not believe in that are too deep. So in that case right there, if, it's a, if it influences the testimony of our church and other people, then I would call them out. If it doesn't, I leave them be because it just takes more time for them. See, it's growing, growing, growing. So sometimes it'll give them time. The Lord will have to deal with them. But it comes down to testimony. See what you stand for, testimony. By the way, when you think about your testimony, you're also going to be careful with how you condemn too before you open your mouth and condemn. Because when you condemn, it can ruin your testimony. And if you don't condemn, it can also ruin your testimony. Mm -hmm. Testimony is a key thing, what you stand for. You see why I don't recommend some preachers and teachers online? My testimony, they're automatically going to associate me with the person. Yeah. Important to understand. So this is advancement in discipleship. That's how you're going to grow. Now. Understanding this fact, what's important to do is that what you've got to do as a disciple now is that I've taught you several things. Is soul winning. That is extremely important. When you do soul winning, you've got to understand that you finally understand what this is, the first point. You understand where you get outside of your own world and you think in other people's shoes. The more you soul win. And then you're going to be more careful with your words. You're going to be a little bit more forceful in your words. And you're going to get the balance. That's why soul winning is so important. And I taught you that discipleship at the first video. So if you haven't yet, which is not good, you're already at 20-something or 30, and you didn't get number three, four, five right yet on soul winning, then you better go back. Yeah, this is crucially important if you want to get these two things right. Mm -hmm. This is crucially important. You need to do soul winning. And your spiritual life guarantee, guarantee improves when you do soul winning. Amen. Yeah. Guarantee it improves. The evidence is people who actually done it. And not just soul win one or a couple souls, but actually keep doing it. Kept coming to street preaching, visitation, passing out tracts in their own time, did soul winning themselves. They saw their spiritual life improve. You got to participate in church. Well, there's no Bible-believing church that I can go to. One, I've mentioned this so many times. 
Go over there, go to the church. If I had some members driving two hours almost to come here, and then they have to drive two hours back almost. And you know what? They spiritually grew. It's worth it. It's worth it. Sometimes I understand there are understandable situations, so don't get me wrong. So if you're that person who's one of those exceptions that cannot attend because the distance is bad for your health, family, circumstances, etc., that's between you and God. I can't judge you on that. I totally understand, and that's between you and God. Only you know if you're in the wrong or in the right, see? So if you're in the right, don't feel guilty about it, and just keep watching our discipleship videos online, and start doing the homework like you're supposed to. <laughs> start doing, participating, doing it. Watch us live all the time, or watch our videos. That way you can start growing. And then start doing some things at your own time as well. It's important. Participating in a church is important. I would even uh, dare say, I would even dare say that uh, if you're struggling in your spiritual life, look, any Christian church would do. <laughs> any Christian church would do. Because as long as you have a saved brother or sister in Christ, there's at least some Christian or spiritual thing you can talk about. So if just watching us online and following us online does not make you spiritually improve and you're actually going through a lot of struggles, because struggles and temptation are especially strong when you're alone. Amen. So you definitely need people around you. So if you're at that position, then yeah, I'd recommend just going to any church. Just for the people around you, that's it. Everything else, just ignore when they're in the wrong. You can just watch us online for that one. We'll clean you up, okay? We'll filter you out, okay? <laughs> But you just need people around you because loneliness is the number one thing why people go back to the same sin problem, why people don't spiritually grow, why people become ego-centered. Loneliness is a, is a really bad thing. You've got to get outside of loneliness. When you participate in church, help them out. Find a ministry that you can help them out in, cleaning up the room. Uh, feeding the poor, if they have a soul winning program that you participate in, you want to help out taking care of the nursery, Sunday school class, preparing food in the kitchen, do that. You've got to do that so that you can spiritually grow because you understand what it's like to help and serve people and you get outside of this one right here. And you become better as a pastor one day if the Lord raises you up to a higher position as a pastor or a teacher or some spiritual a leader that people look up to, you've been used to serving the church so much that you know how to serve people. That's very important to do. Sing a special. Join, uh, uh, just encourage the pastor and the church member who's struggling. Amen. Tell them you're praying for them. Participate. It's so important to participate. Well, I'm a shy guy and, well, okay, you can be a shy person, but at least try to find something to help them out in then you can spiritually grow. It is essentially important to do that. The last thing that I want to close in, now this is the most obvious. Now I saw this in women too, okay? So don't get scared about this, but this is important. Preaching and teaching. Now women cannot become pastors. However, this does not mean that women cannot minister to other women. Women cannot minister to children. We need female Sunday school teachers to take care of the kids. Not only that, if you're going to be a mother one day, how are you going to raise your child right? Yeah, right. So this is the number one thing that I've seen that help people to really study. How you grow more knowledge in Scripture and even get it in your head where your memory would remember it is when you actually do this. When you do this, you're going to grow really fast, exponentially fast. So that's why it's important to do this. Well, why won't you do that yet, preacher? Simple. You don't know basic doctrines yet, yeah. fundamental <laughs> doctrines yet. I can't do that until you get that. So that's why this discipleship class is so important. Once you get all those fundamental doctrines right in uh, beginner's discipleship, then we can go to apologetics and then some preaching and teaching in between. And then in advanced discipleship, I can really show you that and some of my secrets 
on uh, how I get people and then how I persuade people and some of my arguments and then how to study the Bible even better and all that. I'll unlock you some of my secrets over that. But that happens when there's a right foundation first. But preaching and teaching is the most ex, uh, the number one thing that will boom your spiritual growth. But this cannot happen until you're grounded first. And how you're grounded is when you go through this, when you go through this, and when you follow the leader and attend their Bible studies and write notes and get all the basic doctrines right, foundational doctrines right, and you have this humility in your character. I hope that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to you. Maybe the Lord had this for a reason where I don't teach a lesson. It's so that it's a fresh review of where I'm trying to guide you. This is where I'm going to guide you throughout the entire discipleship. But if you have all this in your head, I promise you, guarantee you this, you're going to grow more spiritually than you did before if you follow these methods. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for giving me the wisdom and something to teach. I pray that you'll please bless the Bible study that we're going to have soon. Dismiss us now with your blessing in this discipleship class. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church, as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that He can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what He did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, Pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.